Hey, this week I'm bros, Bibles, and beer. Hey, this let's... often reveals more about what's going on in his brain than it does whatever you say. <laughs> okay, I think there are two ways we can follow God. I think both of them are Christianity. There's the, the religion that Jesus witnessed and the one that he wanted. They shut down the transport, uh, they shut down schools. So after 30 years of building this, basically disappeared within a week. I appreciate efficiency, okay. and I like an efficient <laughs> right. man. And what I'm seeing here is efficiency. economy of words, and That's I like it. Yeah, yes. and I wasn't going to go, but there was a quite cute blonde girl, and she went forward, <laughs> and I just felt God call me at the same time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's so, amazing how that works. Isn't it? Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer. This is Jeff. It's episode 244. Andy, Zach, Zach, Andy, Zach, how's it going? Uh, it's great. Uh, who knew I needed Olympic breaking in my life? Oh, my gosh. Andy? Andy, shout out Nudge Nudge Nation. Okay, what about you, Jeff? <laughs> Kamala 2024 again. <laughs> that was my comedy bit for the show. You said that last time. Too. No, I yeah. didn't. Oh no, I did say. I said Harris 20. Oh, okay. I want to make sure everybody knows Good her first name and her last. And name. then next episode will be her middle name. No, we'll okay. move on. Okay. All right. Then the red wave. Uh, what was your comment about? Would you say? <laughs> I said, shout out Nudge Nudge Nation. Well, I'll see if uh, if any commenters can see what that's an, uh, like an homage to. I'll be interested to see that. Maybe next episode, I'll explain what Nudge Nudge Nation is. <laughs> but uh, it's adjacent to something else. Curious minds want to know. Called Wink Wink Nation. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to make it a thing. I don't know. Maybe it'll. Maybe I can turn it into a thing. To my right. knowledge, it doesn't exist today. All right, Andy, who are we and what do we do? Why are we here? Welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer listeners and YouTube watchers. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, wherever you are. This is Bros, Bibles, and Beer. We are a podcast where we have uh, serious conversations about faith and culture without taking ourselves too seriously. I am Andy McCraw, joined by my guest hosts, Jeff Pearson and Zach Crater. And we have a guest tonight, which is fantastic. Paul yeah. Gibbs. Paul Gibbs is it's in the here. house. Yes. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. The long-awaited return of Paul Gibbs yeah. back from Jeff. When was this? 2017, episode wow. 68. Episode 68, if you want to... Uh... When I had all my hair, it was still dark, <laughs> and I had both knees working. <laughs> <laughs> that one's audio only, though, but True. you know it's available on all podcast platforms. But so. everybody could... Easily tell that Paul was Texan. Oh, so. right. Yeah. Yeah, it comes through. You can't hide it, even though you're trying to. Yep. Well, <laughs> very East Texas by about 5,000 miles, I think. So. <laughs> yeah, East yeah. Texas is a, is a different area. I once uh, flew in to uh, buy a vehicle in Texas, and I f it was so far east that I landed in Shreveport and then <laughs> took an Uber across the border yeah. to be able to go there. Yeah. So. So wow. I drive here from DFW sometimes, and it takes me eight hours just to get out of Texas. It's crazy. Wow. Oh, really? I think El Paso is nearer here than it is my house. Oh, my gosh. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'll, uh, but did you drive? I think we should have you get a little closer with that mic. We'll, oh, we'll bring sorry. it up just a bit. Yeah, that's good. A lot better? Perfect. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, did you drive here this time? What are no. you doing in California? Yeah, no, I flew. What brings you out here? Okay. So I'm just doing um, teaching and vacation, kind of mixture of work and chilling. So okay. Good, yeah. That's cool. Nice. Well, well, we'll get into why you're here in a second, but did any of y'all, I did that for you, watch <laughs> uh, the Olympics? Are we into the Olympics? They're past now. They're done. Yes. But I saw... Olympic breaking, and I didn't know I needed that in my life. Watching the guys, the gold medal matches brought me so much joy. <laughs> How much fun they were having, and breaking is canceled. This was the trial run for the Olympics, oh. and they're not bringing it back. They're not? Nope. Because so, uh, of the Australian thing? Or? I think they decided <laughs> that before. If you haven't seen... What is the Australian the, thing? That's what they called it during the pandemic. They're like, this is the Australian thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're there, a bunch of criminals down there, aren't they? <laughs> there, <right>. was, <laughs> there was a young woman that competed for Australia and got a, a zero. And you'll have to look it up. I should have brought a clip. Since I was going to bring it up, I should have brought a clip. It looked like she was making it up on the fly. She did a couple moves that I definitely couldn't have done. But I think she spun on her head once for a moment. Like laying on her side and just spinning around with her feet. Like doing <laughs> stuff that was weird. 
And uh, apparently she has a PhD in in cultural dance or something. She had basically a PhD in breaking. I think there's a, a, a fancier name for it. She woke break break dancing. Yeah, and she got a zero, and uh, it was pretty embarrassing. Terrible. Well, but that's yeah. not why they're not bringing it back. It is kind of subjective. It is weird. Like the Olympics is all about like who is objectively faster, who is objectively mm. stronger, that sort of thing. But just seeing the guys do the craziest stuff, and mm. after every every match or whatever you would call it, just there was so much love, like the high fiving and like, hey, good job and. Uh, that was really fun. We got to watch the uh, gold medal game, Team USA basketball uh, against France. And that was way closer than I expected. And we were at a bar up in Kernville, and uh, which is just in the middle of nowhere on the river. And in fact, I mean, we're in, a few of us are enjoying some of the fine uh, Kern River brewing uh, beers this evening beautiful but watching that fourth quarter where steph curry hits four three-pointers three of them in a row and like seals the deal well our table was going crazy but i think nobody else in the place was really that interested in watching so yeah. we were like, <laughs> oh yeah and kind of expecting like other people to join in with us and it was crickets besides us <laughs> but that was fun all right well let's I, I watched a ton of olympics i stayed until 2 3 a.m yeah. Every single night. Yeah, it's great. I mean, track and field, swimming, gymnastics. I was watching speed climbing. Have you ever seen a human yeah. being run up oh, a, yeah. a, a wall? wall? Yeah, Spider-Man. <laughs> Men and women. I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. Now, Paul, who do you root for when you're watching the Olympics? Oh, Great Britain. Every time? Every time, yeah. What if it's not Great Britain versus the U.S.? What if Great Britain is not in the mix? Yeah, I think if it was US, I'd probably support US, but um, no, it's Great Britain, if I'm honest. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. Paul, do you, have, do you have both your passports with you right now? Not with <laughs> me. No, but I do have Because we were going to take one after that comment. <laughs> but you, do you, know you are a, a dual do you know citizen. This, yeah, I am. Do you know there's a uh, chart of um, the better passports? Do you know? Do you know that the better passports? Yeah, there's a thing of how powerful a passport is. Like, and uh, I think USA was seven, and uh, the UK is eight at the moment. I think Singapore was number one. And what kind of powers do they tend to wow. possess? It's like the invisibility, places... or <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like how many countries you can get into without a visa and stuff like that. Oh so, wow. Yeah. Yeah, there's Who, a, there's a whole remember, out there. Who's the most powerful? Singapore. Right? I think it was Singapore, oh. but I think it changes. But yeah, probably Russia. <laughs> I'm thinking that's most likely the one. Wow, that that's fascinating. Yeah, I would have really, never guessed. Yeah, Singapore. I would have thought the United States. Yeah, I would have thought that, but I'd, no. I think right. GB is quite powerful because, uh, well, maybe it's changed now because this was when we were in the European Union, right? So you could walk into so many countries and now you need a visa okay so we probably dropped down the charts now so to go into any country in europe if you live in europe you now have to have a visa to now you just walk across oh, i was in um, okay. Okay. i was in germany a few months ago and you, you you're driving into other countries not realizing you're in another country right there's just nothing there's no border yeah. It still took him eight hours to get out of Texas yeah, before he exactly, got to yeah. Germany. So it sounds yeah. identical to every single city in South Orange County, where you cannot tell when you've gone from city to city. <laughs> they all look identical. There you go. So uh, Zach, are we going? Uh, yeah, we do. Which are we going first? We do have Jeff's got a special surprise. I hope you're on your toes, Paul, because okay. he likes to do a lightning round. And this is going to be quick and painless. This often reveals more about what's going on in his brain than it does whatever you say. <laughs> okay. But if you're just ready to roll with it, Jeff, we have no idea what's coming, Andy and I. No. This is all Jeff. This is rated G. So and we don't have a jingle for it yet, but oh. uh, lightning round. How could Here we, we not, go. How Paul could we gets. not have a jingle? Lightning round. Ba -dum, bump, bonk. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. All right. Paul Gibbs. The first question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, which which is easier to move in mission work, the church or a teenage boy? Oh, the church. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Was that a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, just a Wa water or wine for you? 
Water or wine? Well, yes. I'm going to say water because I like to be in the sea. Okay. So. Beer or soda? Beer. Soda or water? Mm, water. Fish and chips or burger and fries? Fish and chips. Has anyone ever accused you of being a New Zealander? Australian. Okay, what's the difference between the two accents? They're not British. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened to men? What happened to men? Yeah, what happened to men? I don't know. Yeah. We still have them in the UK. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. United or city? United. Did Sir Alex walk on water in the 90s? Pretty much. Yeah, he pretty much did, yeah. <laughs> Soccer reference. Uh, uh, I'm like, who's... You have Jesus over for dinner. Do you offer... Or ask him to turn water into wine or offer him a Boddington pub ale? Boddington's pub ale. Does he accept it and drink it? Um, yeah, I think he would. Does probably. he pound it? <laughs> Does he pound it? Does he pound that beer? I he, don't know what that means. He's uh, got a gluten intolerance, so he has to go slow. <laughs> uh, pound it is you just down it. I don't know. No, okay. I don't well, know. We'll, not we'll, we'll ask that. Jesus later. <laughs> uh, what would Jesus pickup line be in a pub oh i'm so glad i finally stopped you wow <laughs> well, you've been doing pick great up, by is this about picking up women or yes wow <laughs> okay i have no idea i'm not every answer that's going through my brain would get me into trouble <laughs> So I'm, 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 I'm gonna let you off the hook. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Nicely done. Insert crowd applause sound here. <laughs> That's you know sometimes uh, our guests don't fare so well with Jeff's line of questioning, okay. but you are on point tonight. So okay. good That's job. Good. And by the way, Sir Alex is Sir Alex Ferguson. He was the manager of Manchester United yeah. during a stretch that lasted a very long time. Um, and that did that earn him his knighthood? Yeah. Or was it already there? Actually, I don't no, know what he got. I, I don't know it, officially what his knighthood for. But maybe it, it was it, after it, the treble. I, I don't know. Yeah. But they they ran the tables yeah. for many, many years. It was a pretty amazing yeah. thing. Legendary. All right. So let's get into it. You are here for a reason. You reached out to us, and thank you for doing so. But you're with uh, the Pace Movement. Mm. Am I saying that right? Yep. Okay. Because my dyslexic brain wants to do P it differently every time. P A I S movement yeah. dot com, not pays. Um, no pays dot life. Pays dot life. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. And you. what was that an acronym? Yeah, no, it's a um, New Testament Greek word for a child who serves the king. Of it. Yeah. All right. So, do you want to tell us, give us a little uh, elevator pitch for what they what you do, or do you, should we roll the video? Is that what you're thinking? Let's roll the video. How about we do that? Sure. We'll yeah. do the video and get a little commentary. Will you bounce us up there? Thank there you, we sir. Go. Internet. Wait for it. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Once more with feeling. <laughs> Maybe close and come back and... yeah. All right, lose that screen real quick. Uh, While this, you're doing that, this is beautiful. You could probably uh, maybe start to kind of intro a little bit to uh, for us of of what what this is and how you. Yeah, doing. sure. So, uh, Pays was founded in 1992. So we celebrated our 30th anniversary a while back. Um, we essentially equip um, the church to live life on mission. Um, but we founded. We started by doing schools work in Manchester. Uh, we're in about 20 countries around the world. So kind of bridging the gap, mobilizing young adults, giving them a free gap year or longer training. Um, and they're going to schools, mentor young people, um, bridge the gap relation between school and church. But since I last talked to you guys, there are kind of two new areas of what we do. Um, one was, so that was the apprenticeship. Now we have the academy where uh, we have training for teenagers so they can live life on mission where they are in their school. And then we have an allies program, which uh, equips churches as well. So, and the whole thing is kind of, we've got this whole um, concept of being kingdom centric that drives the whole thing. So that's awesome. Yeah. And then like, where did the idea for this even come from? Well, I'm going to go back to what I shared seven years ago. Yeah. If that's okay. Yeah. So, so I, I was born with yeah. asthma and eczema and I became, um, I um, 
became really ill when I was 13 years old. So my eczema was septic. Uh, so I had to lie in a bath at night. And when I took my, I had to do that because when I took my bandages off, my skin used to peel off. So I had to soak the bandages. It was bad. And um, there, the, my parents weren't Christian, but there was a teacher at school who was advertising what you and I would call a tent crusade. And the boys from my school were going and coming back going, oh, it's really weird. They had their hands up. They were singing. It was bizarre. But we think we saw people getting healed. And one of my friends said to me, Paul, you should go because you're a bit like a cripple. And so I <laughs> went. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So I went. And your the, skin is bad. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, they used to have a game called Crucify the Christian. I don't know if I told you about that last time. But anyway. I don't think so. So I'll say about that later. Put, so, yeah, put a pin in that yeah. one. Yeah. So I... um. So I went and just, I always say this, that the evangelist had tricked me. So he, he, it was the first time I remember hearing the gospel and I didn't understand it completely by, I just knew it was right. Yeah. And um, so he did the whole, if you want to say the prayer, say the prayer. If you said the prayer, put your hand up, which I thought was really weird. And it was, if you got your hand up, stand up, switch. I'm thinking last thing and no more. And then it was, um, if you stood up, please come to the back. And I wasn't going to go, but there was a quite cute blonde girl and she went forward and I just felt God call me at the same time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's so, amazing how that works. Isn't it, just it? Lines up. The know. Lord knows he has a way. That's right. He moves in not so mysterious ways. <laughs> yeah. So I went, I went, I went forward. And of course the deal is the leading to the Lord while everybody else is getting prayed for. So I missed out on that. So, um, the next thing was, um, go to, go to this church I went to church. First message I heard is um, seek first the kingdom of God and you don't need a priest. You can just pray directly to God. So I prayed directly to God. He would heal me. And the whole of my eczema, not just the septic part, but disappeared after about nine days. So I'm thinking, well, this is good news and bad news. You know, Was this a prayer you said just sort of to yourself or did you say it out loud? Like, Ooh. how did that go? I'm pretty sure I said it out loud. I think it was kneeling by my bed and I said it. That's just to memory. yourself. You're the only person there. Yeah, I was on my own. Yeah, and this is—I mean, how how long was it from the moment that you stood up and you know you raised your hand and stood up and then followed the blonde girl to the back <laughs> to to that moment? What? How long? It would have between? been nearly two weeks, I think. Oh, that's it. Yeah. So you're you don't know how any of this uh, stuff works. I mean, not no. that we any of us know how I it works, know. <laughs> but that's you're. This is, this is a pure reaction, a very pure reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably pure faith of, okay, well, if I can pray to God, I'll pray. I don't think I was asking for it. I may ask that he would heal me, but yeah. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't use any fancy language or anything. So, yeah. And then, um, yeah, so I get healed and I thought, well, this is good news and bad news. Good news. God is real. The Bible's true. Heaven's reality. Bad news. Um, the devil's real. But the Bible is true and hell's a reality. Mm. And I wanted to tell people about Jesus. Backslid 18, came back to the Lord at 21. Um, wanted to be a missionary. Did some training, came back to Manchester. Um, and then I just, I won't go through the whole story, but I got opportunity to go into schools, um, reaching these young people. And lots of them wanted to find out more about God. They wouldn't go to church because there was nobody there they knew. Yeah. And so... I went and just recruited for the people and said, look, I'll disciple you in what I do. And then um, we'll go into schools. We'll be based in different places, different churches. So if they're from north or the east of the city, one of us will be in a local church. And that's what happened. And that, in my mind, that was the vision. Then 30 years later, we're in 20 nations around the world doing that. And the last time you were here seven years ago, I think you were just going into your 14th in South Africa. Oh, yeah. Did okay. you did you guys go yeah. into South yeah, Africa? Yeah, South Africa, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we saw some good stuff happening, and we're just about to appoint a new director, actually, for that. Nice. So what have been, what have been the greatest challenges, so since 2017 um, to now, what have been the greatest challenges that you've incurred? Well, it's kind of obvious, but the biggest issue was COVID mm -hmm. for us. So we were exploding. Um I got, I don't know if you guys believe in prophecies, but I got this weird message from somebody just before COVID, which I would say was about COVID, but we were doing great. I just got all my board members together and we were like, hey, um, 
that things have never been so good. We were kind of exploding. Churches were coming, asking us for more teams. And then I get this message. And, and some, it was very strange. They wrote it. It was an email. Hmm. And it was very poetic. And it was called The Purge. And it was supposed to be specifically about Whoa. pays. That, but, uh, that sounds ominous. Yeah. Well, and it was for pays. And it, it talks about people not being able to breathe. So this things, things come in. It's in the book. Things uh, People are not going to be able to breathe. It's very symbolic. And it, at the time, it meant absolutely nothing to me. I'm like, this is just weird. So mentally, I put it in my back pocket. And then it wasn't that long later, um, COVID came on the scene. When you think about what the main thrust of what we were doing, particularly at the time, was schools, people coming from overseas, going from one country to another right. to be missionaries. So they shut down the transport, uh, they shut down schools. So after 30 years of building this, it basically disappeared within a week. It was heartbreaking. Gosh. Slow growth, steady growth. And then just, it was tough really, yeah. So that would have been the biggest challenge, I guess. So, And we're in a kind of rebuilding process. Mm -hmm. yeah. The good thing has been that there was some vision that God was giving us. And I was trying to get our national directors to take on board. And because we things were just flying, they were just so busy just managing teams. It was getting really tough. So what, what the silver lining was COVID gave this break. And in that time, we were able to put in the stuff that we wanted to put in. So now we're much stronger. Uh, we're much more effective um, and we're kind of re in the rebuilding process. Can I ask you a little bit about sort of your process, whether it's personal or as an organization for trying to, to discern or determine, you use the, use the term God's vision um, of, of what that is. Like, what does that, what does that look like for you to define and understand what God's vision is for the organization? So I always say that I, I believe vision comes from an awkward conversation with God. <laughs> so uh, what we refer to as vision, the, the sign or the moment, the th is really just something that grabs our attention. Yeah. So you think about Moses and the burning bush. The burning bush wasn't a vision. It just grabbed his attention and led into a conversation. Paul gets his sight removed, starts a conversation. And so for me, I'm asking God a question and then he asks me a question and I ask him one back. And as that conversation, if you start, if you like, we're over here, and as that conversation happens, I think the vision gets tighter and clearer. Mm. That's the way I would see it. And, and I think what happens is you have to be prepared to ask God awkward questions because he's, he's not insecure. He's not thinking, oh, you know, I hope they don't ask me that one. <laughs> um, and at the same time, allow him to ask you awkward questions. And I think it's when we stop asking or allowing him to ask us that our, our vision just settles or so I think some some of us are living off vision things God said five years ago because that was the end of the that was the last time we had the awkward conversation and how do you when you're when you say God's you're asking God question God questions and God is asking questions back how for somebody that's like okay that sounds weird mm. how how does that happen is it like a feeling a sense are you hearing something? Are you hearing something inside? Are you hearing something audible? Um, how does that work for you? That's a great question. Well, for me, I'm quite a strategic, very practical person. So for me, it's quite cerebral, if I'm honest. It's less feeling. Um, so me, I'll be asking a question because something's got my attention. And I'm looking for answers in God's word. Um, I am looking for the Holy Spirit to speak to me. but um, And very rarely, if ever, I'm uh, looking for signs. Hmm. Occasionally I get signs, but I'm not looking for them. I'm really trying to understand what's in the word of God. Hmm. And I think, you know, asking what did Jesus do is is really important to me. So I like to understand. That. That's why I'm so interested in Bible. So I want to get the context. I think what Jesus did helps us understand what Jesus meant by what Jesus said. And without the context, I think we can make up any kind of vision, you know? Yeah, I think we had the, the conversation of uh, what would Jesus do and you, def you, you quickly clarified, that clarified it and said, "What did like? What, what did, did Jesus? What uh, did Jesus do? What What did Jesus do? Um, as opposed to like, well, um, what would he do in this situation? And you're like, well, look back at what he did, yeah, and because you know, that clarifies, there, yeah, because there are essentially there are five, four or five different, slightly different versions of Jesus here, sure, and and so what would happen is surprisingly Jesus tends to do 
what we would like him to do. Mm -hmm. But I think when you look at what he did and you really root it in, in the study of the word and the context, especially it, for me, at least that brings clarity. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause my Jesus would do a, Way different things than Jeff's, I promise you. Jeff's Jesus <laughs> is asking the awkward question, the awkwardest of pickup lines at bars. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to... That, that's been in the back of my brain since that... <laughs> what would, if Jesus were trying to... This is playful and it's a joke, okay, people? Don't be offended. Or be offended. Just send us a comment we won't read. Um <laughs> What would what would he do in a bar? What would he do to to maybe flirt a little bit and you know not in a salacious way, but that's actually kind of a fascinating experiment that I'm not going to do right now. If but. Scott were here right now, he'd be calling blasphemy right now. Blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> so you heard them right, Paul. They're saying blasphemy <laughs> <laughs> because there was an episode where maybe we were a little okay, buzzed. Let's not go down. Let's not go down this path. And, and Jeff was calling. Uh, I wasn't. You said it though, but I hadn't had anything to drink. Oh well, then you were drunk on the spirit. But he said that's Amen. blasph of me. <laughs> so that's blasph of me of the Holy Spirit. So ever since then, we say blasph, blasph of, me. of me. Okay. Well, bless your heart, Jeff. You're good. So that's uh, that's helpful because I think um, one thing that stuck out to me is that you described discerning God's vision as this process, this like back and forth mm. process, um, when. I feel like more often than not, I have conversations with people who will describe it as just like this one-to-one -one download. Mm. I had a moment, mm. and and I and I got everything that I needed. Mm. The file completed downloading, and now I'm off and running. Yeah, right. But you you also talk about other areas of discernment. I was going to ask you: Are there also like trusted individuals and people that you engage with where you're like I? I think I'm hearing this. I think God is telling me this. I think this this is the part of the vision. What what's your take on this? You know what? That's interesting because probably probably if I'm honest, my answer might be no. If I'm honest, I do have trusted individuals that ask for advice on stuff. But when it so it might be yeah, it might be if I've got a plan or strategy. But it's not so much is God saying this. It's more I think God's saying this. How should we do this? Because uh, I think there's wiggle room, right? I yeah. mean, God. I, I believe vision, it's best not to see vision as a th target. It's better to see it as a theme. Mm. So, you know, Jesus calls um, Peter to be a fisher of men and Abram's going to be a father of nations. And I think that's really helpful because, uh, forgive me if I said this before, but um, I think one of the problems we have is we need a vision of God, but we have a vision of vision. And so when the vision is doing well, we're doing spiritually well. Um, and if we're in the vision, we're on form. Like, I know so many youth pastors who are absolutely just totally radical with their youth, but their next door neighbor doesn't even know they're a Christian. Tell me, like unpack that mm. comment, the vision of vision, because I don't know if what's in my head is matching what your definition is. Yeah, so vision of vision. So, so we get excited about the vision more than we get excited about God. Um, and so we have a, no, so let's say me, I have, um, so, so I, it might help to define this whole Christian-centric, kingdom-centric thing in a minute, but okay, kind of step back and do that. Yeah, yeah. So yes. I think there are two ways we can follow God. I think both of them are Christianity. There's the, the religion that Jesus witnessed and the one that He wanted, and I define them this way. Um, so Christian-centric, I pursue my vision, I do it God's way, so God gives me what I want. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna not sin. I'm gonna make sure I do what God wants because then I'll live a blessed life. And yeah. I think that's, that's fine. There's no problem with that. But, and we may not have time to unpack this, but Jesus, I believe was presenting the kingdom, seek first the kingdom. So to be kingdom centric is I pursue God's kingdom. Yeah. I do it God's way so I can give him what he wants. Mm. And so for me, um, a vision of vision, you know, we often criticize the world and say, you know, they're more interested in creation. Than they are in God. Mm. But I think sometimes we're more interested in vision that God gives us than we are in a vision of who he is. And I think that can limit us into, it can squeeze us into something. Whereas my, my, my vision is a theme. So I make missionaries. That's, that's my little motto I have for myself. Well, that means I need to do it on my streets or I can do it with pays or I can do it in a church. Or I can do it in my family setting. It's, it's universal. Uh, whereas if my vision is pays, 
it just streamlines it. Is that making sense? Yeah, it does. Um, the translation I did in my head is um, the vision should be the what, which is separate from the how. Like it's what you're going towards. How you choose to get to that can show well, up in true, infinite ways. Yeah, that's true. Right? Definitely. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. But it, um, the part that that I may be still wrestling with is the separation between uh, following God versus following a vision that you believe is from God. Yeah. Well, I think again, Christian centric, we prioritize our ministry. Yeah. Kingdom centric, we prioritize His mission. So there can be times, and I've, this is one of the challenges you talked about, many times when I've felt that people, maybe my own as well, people's ministry has limited what we can do for his mission. So, you know, and let me give a positive example of that yeah. rather than a negative one. So uh, many years ago, my pastor, who I think was very kingdom centric, um, he, there was a church down the road that was really, they had no youth. And they said, could we use Paul? I was paid by my church. Could we use Paul for two weeks to do what you guys would call a VBS? Yeah. So we did this VBS. They got an instant group of young people. What did you guys saved. call it? I can't remember. I think I called it Mega Mix or something. I can't remember what I called it. That sounds it. a lot cooler than VBS. And well, it was in the mix. 80s. <laughs> um, we well, like alliteration here. Yeah. Like bros, babbles, and beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then the problem was, He's saying to my pastor, that's great. Now we've got these young people. We don't know what to do. <laughs> so my pastor says, well, I'll give you Paul for a year. So I'll pay Paul and he will do your youth work. And, and he didn't say on a different night. He said the same night because in England, we kind of do youth work Friday nights. So my church paid me to help that church because, that, because my pastor realized right now they've got a better opportunity to advance the kingdom of God. Um, uh, does that I see make what sense? you're saying. And, and he didn't prioritize his ministry, his church. So he launched, you know, he, he, he encouraged me and others. So we've reached millions now over 30 years, but he'll never stand up. He'll never get invited to a conference because he didn't build a large church himself. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but he knew that. And so he prioritized his mission rather than his own ministry, God's mission. And I think that's, that's really important. And um, yeah, I've got all sorts to say about that. I think that makes that that's helpful. Yeah, uh, because well, the way I interpret what you describe is, you can get very uh, small-minded, maybe, yeah. and just a little myopically focused yeah. on a uh, on a small thing. And I and that example is really helpful. Where it's like, is your is your goal to help? youth or just help your youth who yeah. happen to exist on this square block yeah, you go. yeah right and it's interesting just i think it plays out even in church you know so i i travel i speak in churches i'll ask people to describe the church yeah no problem it's not a building it's the people of god fantastic describe what is the kingdom of heaven um is that the place you go to and Einstein said, if you can't describe something simply, you don't know it yourself. Yeah. And I think most people, even in Bible colleges, most people I ask can't succinctly explain what the kingdom of heaven is. And I think that's because we've prioritized what we do for God um, and, and what that gives us sometimes rather than giving him what he wants. He wants that all men will come to the knowledge of, of him, right? Uh, he wants his kingdom to advance and and some of us don't even know what that actually means. <clears throat> so what does that mean? You oh, Zach, man, I was coming to you. I was going to say, so Zach, what is the kingdom of heaven? Oh, you're going to ask me? The, uh, yeah, and then you... I and knew, and you, how is it different than that definition of the church? Is it, what? So you... <clears throat> Pace exists to advance the kingdom of God the way Jesus modeled it. And I saw another blurb on the website to equip churches with kingdom teaching. So what is kingdom teaching? Look at that. Well, he just sidestepped your question. <laughs> that was smooth too. You're welcome. But I caught it, bitch. Answer the question. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of politicians lately, so I'm getting good at this, mm -hmm. at not answering questions. Do you have a do you have a working definition for the kingdom of heaven? The well, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is is around you. Like you can't it's not like there or there or up there. 
it's it's around you and i so i don't know that i'm defining it i just maybe it's i know it when i see it and maybe it is like when the church is being the church um not the building but the people of god doing jesus things like loving their enemies praying for their persecutors serving people uh dying to themselves i feel like that's a slice of the kingdom of heaven i think what you described is is probably the good differentiator would would you most of you guys imagine that people will fall in like one of two camps kingdom of heaven is either intended to occur here and now as like the restoration of all things or it is like dispensationalism i'm 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 heading up with my halo and my wings to fly off into mm-hmm. the clouds yeah my my current where i currently am is the kingdom of heaven isn't somewhere else yeah it, it might be i mean i think we can separate ourselves from it um but it's not like some destination to be achieved after you die as long as you have Jesus in your heart i mean that there there might be a reality to that but functionally for us here and now and i think according to jesus it was something that's accessible here and now but tell me i'm wrong or tell me i'm right or i don't think you're wrong it's just what what actually is it yeah so so the kingdom of heaven the greek word basilia if i'm saying it correctly pronounce it correctly with my manchester accent uh, means the rule realm reign or royalty of god so when something comes under the lordship of christ there is the kingdom of god um, so the kingdom of God isn't a place. Uh, the kingdom of God is a state of being, if you like. So, mm. so, um, so for instance, the kingdom of therefore the kingdom of God is in us but near us. It's it's here but it's yet to come, right? Because there's, there's so there's more to it. You could say. Yeah. So you, like, is it say fair something. to use kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven yes, interchangeably? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. Yeah. And so you know Jesus. So one of the ways I describe it when I'm talking to congregation. When I'm unpacking sick first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you, is imagine somewhere you know very, very well your street, your office, your neighborhood, your community, school, wherever it is, and imagine everything there happens the way things happen in heaven. So imagine people honor God and glorify God the way they are in heaven. Uh, imagine people talk to each other, interact with each other, the way things we understand will happen in heaven. Um, Jesus said, if you make that your primary concern, everything else will be added to you. Yeah. So how does one how does one glorify God? What is that what does that look like for Paul? Glorifying God. Yeah. Ah, uh, I would say it's really simple. For me, that's just explaining to people, showing people what God has done done in my life would be the, the way I've done it. I had a really weird, it's funny you should say that because I was thinking about this this morning. Um, when I was about, when I went to try and be trained to be a missionary, again, I'm going to go back to prophetic words if that's okay, but somebody said, um, Paul, you're good, God's going to place a glass bowl over you that's transparent and if you seek first the kingdom of God, he's going to um, affect your life in such a way that people are going to see what it looks like to be blessed because you seek first the kingdom of God. So he's going to use you as like a lab rodent type thing. And um, <laughs> that's what I was thinking about this morning. I kind of, cause I'll be 60 in a few weeks or months time. What? And I'm kind of like, yeah. This dude looks good. Oh, thank you. So I, I've been, can, so you can't It's because your beer isn't finished and that's probably <laughs> what's going on here. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of looking back on my life and, and thinking that's, you know, people say that to me all the time. Yeah. And family members who are not Christians will say to me, someone's clearly looking after you. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that's a testimony to God. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but for me, that's, that's you know, making sure people see it's God, it's not me. Mm. So maybe the, the, the challenging question in the, if we were in a larger room with lots of other personalities, well, but it still even works with us would be, well, do, so does that mean that it's all gone well for you? No. And that, because maybe my life doesn't feel good right now to mm-hmm. me, or hasn't ever felt good. Mm-hmm. So did I not, have I not been blessed by God and what did I do wrong? Yeah, so um, again, in the kingdom-centric teaching, um, 
why I would say is Christian centric. When we think about his righteousness, uh, we pursue righteousness in order to be blessed. Um, to be kingdom centric, I think we pursue righteousness in order to be anointed because we're trying to give him what he wants, right? So, um, Paul, uh, sorry, David talks about creating me a pure heart, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And it says, because then I will lead transgressors to you. Mm. So it all fits together. There's a why, there's a purpose behind that. It's not restore to me the joy of your salvation, full stop. It's not creating a, me a pure heart, so be more like you. It's so that I might advance the kingdom of God. And so I'm kind of going around about the answer sure. here. So for me, the priority is I want to live, and I, I don't, but I want to live the purest life I can in order that God will anoint me so that I can give him what he wants. That's that's what I'm driving towards. That's what I'm aiming for. Yeah. Um, so come back to your question. Along the way, I've been blessed, um, but there's been very, very tough times as well and difficult times. And I've got a friend and she... Um, she said she reached far more. She she had a really bad. In fact, she's still going through it. She had a really bad time with um, a sickness, but she found a new way to glorify God in her sickness. Yeah, uh, and people looking at her and thinking, "Wow, you're still pray a bit like Job. You're still praising God, even though all these bad things are happening to you." Yeah, but she was glorifying God. So I think it's different for different people. There's, it's Love that. it's probably worth. I feel like the word blessed has been. Diluted, hijacked, mm. hijacked, diluted. Yeah, um, and maybe, now it's about prosperity, right? And having a car and all this kind of stuff. For sure, it it became a hashtag, and it was associated with you and your luxury car, exactly, and, yeah. and, and on your Instagram post, yeah. hashtag blessed. Um, but maybe share a little bit about like what that definition means, like to you, coupled with it, you said anointed a few times, and that's maybe not as common. I see fewer uh, hashtag anointed. <laughs> Posts. Yeah. <laughs> I do hashtag blessed, but but after, I don't think I've ever seen one. <laughs> yeah, but maybe talk about that a minute too afterward. Well, for me, blessed is uh, a lot of it's just peace of mind, peace with God. So righteousness. I used to think the righteousness was about moral, uh, moral purity. So I used to think righteousness is, um, you know, I'm holier. I think holy thoughts. Um, but that's just. Moral purity is the outworking of righteousness. To be righteous is to be righted with God. Yeah. So you're in line with God. You start to want what God wants. So Abraham, the first pilgrim, pilgrim becomes Abraham. Um, and what the Jews or the sages would say is that the significance of the change of name is that God adds an initial from his holy name to Abraham to make Abraham. Basically saying, this is their summary, that along the journey, along the vision the journey went on, God's dream became his dream. So he started to want what God wants. And um, and as we align ourselves with God, moral purity becomes an outworking of that. So what I'm pursuing is, is, a, is a peace of mind that comes from a lack of, are you familiar with um, cognitive, is it? Oh, I can't, I've just lost the the words now cognitive, cognitive dissonance yes cognitive dissonance yeah, yeah. so our behaviors and our beliefs i mean i things. am but i'm not well, well it's very oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry get that so, so not a good job. for me for me a, la <laughs> a lack of that you know that that emotional turmoil between i believe this but i behave this way the more we can line our, our, ourselves up or i believe me. this but i see this in the world that's probably the big uh, big one that we all encounter yeah. right yeah yeah uh, a yeah. god is good evil exists yeah there you go so for me blessed blessed is that anointing is um when i think when basically god gets involved in what you're doing so things don't necessarily become easier but they what you do doesn't necessarily become easier but it becomes more effective hmm. that would be my way of explaining it so is is doing advancing the kingdom does that just look like trying to get as many people to become Christians as possible? Is this just like converting the nations or um, w what's the difference between that? Cause that's often the, the missional goal of most missionaries right. is to, is to get converts, mm. which sometimes can feel a little manipulative. Like, yeah, we'll help you. We'll feed you. But first you got to listen to our video first or mm -hmm. um, which doesn't sound like you're doing that. Um, and I, 
I confess I'm coming from it from a sort of deconstructed re kind of refinding my faith sea legs as it were and I I don't like to use some of the, the verbiage that's really Christianese sounding because it um I feel like people that aren't Christians, it might throw them like it's like a different language sometimes. Mm. I understand why people use it and it describes certain things um, that and it might be necessary at times, but it's just not where I'm at. Um, and I'm rambling a little bit, but um, maybe talk about like advancing the kingdom. Is that just converting people? Is that different than making disciples? And what are, what are you teaching the youth to do or mm. how to achieve that? So, well, a big part of it is that, but but it's more than that, isn't it? So it, it's, it, if the kingdom of God is, and I'm, this is a very crass or simple way of saying it, if the kingdom of God is things happening on earth the way they happen in heaven, then part of that is people glorifying mm. him and coming into relationship with him. But there's other things going on as well. So advancing mm -hmm. the kingdom of God is anything that's bringing about the lordship of, of Christ or lordship of God, anything that's modeling what he does and, and the way he works. So I don't feel as I'm explaining that really well, but for me, a big part of it for me is leading people to Jesus. That's key. I mean, at the moment I spend most of my time trying to convert Christians <laughs> indirectly. I'm trying to convert say more Christians. Say more about that. Cause there's, do we all go to the, like the one dude in our mind right now who hangs out on Huntington beach pier who like, or a version of that guy, yeah, a version of the guy. I don't, I, what's his name? Oh, he has an interesting name. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know his name. Oh, gosh. Do you know what I'm talking about? What are you Producer guys talking Nate? about? The dude, he's on Huntington Beach Pier. He's got lots of YouTube videos. And he's like, he interviews people. Hey, have you ever lied in your life? Well, yeah, I guess I've lied. He oh, laid, then, he, then you're a liar. He lays traps. Yeah, yeah. He lays, okay. uh, uh, have you ever have you ever stolen Have you ever stolen anything? Uh, yeah, I've stolen. Oh, you're, then you're a thief. Oh, okay. And like, he sets all these things up. You're a sinner. And, and so let me, let me point out the shame of your sin and convince you at this point to, to accept Jesus. Right. I'm not saying that people shouldn't recognize sin in their life, but um, the question that always comes for me about that approach is like, how long does that, how long will that last? Yeah. So we, uh, again, I keep referring to the books, forgive me, but um, so, so, do you mind if I just mention this for a minute? So yeah. kingdom centric, well, that's about converting Christians. So kingdom centric is, this idea of moving from the Jesus, the religion that Jesus witnessed to the one that he wanted. So yeah. virtually everything Jesus said was to believers. Hmm. So, so I'm not saying they knew who he was, but they believed in God. Yeah. I mean, they followed up mountains. They, so all those kind of verses that we use for non-Christians, if you look at most of them, they, they were aimed at his hardcore believers, actually. Hmm. Um, so he's trying to explain to them something that they don't understand about their religion yet. Mm. Um, because the, in the heart of God, there's a different, he's not looking for a transactional relationship, right? And so he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't be like the pagans. Well, is that because the pagans, I used to think all oh, that, the pagans obviously were always after worldly things and they thought right. that would make them happy. But what he was saying was the pagans basically asked a different kind of question. So the pagans would go to their gods, and they would sacrifice and they, they would go and uh, they would basically ask the question, if I do this, will you bless me? Or if I do this, will you bless me? And Jesus says, don't be like the pagans, seek first the kingdom of God. Because what was happening was essentially it was a whole generation, and I think it still exists, that basically want the same thing the world wants, they just believe that God will give it them. Mm. So I'm a Christian, I, I want a blessed life. I want, a, a, you know, none of these things are bad. You know, I want to be healthy, healthy, whatever. But if I put God first in my life, that's how I get those things. Sure. But but Jesus is saying, no, that in the heart of God, he wants you to want what he wants, that you will seek first the kingdom of God. And so in the book, I go through 10 areas of our faith where we can slowly, gradually move from being, it's not like we're one or the other, move from one to the other. So one of them is the gospel. So I don't preach Jesus came to rescue you. I preach Jesus came to recruit you. Hmm. Along the way, he had to rescue you because how can dance bring light? So I, I was in, um, I was in a, a, a during COVID, I was in a school in Europe. It was a strange school. It was a boarding school. All the staff were Christians. None of the students were Christians. And um, they had a, but there was a compulsory chapel service on Tuesday night. And they said to me, 
would you preach? Will you, will you preach? And I, I said, sure. I said, what happens? You know, if I, if I lead somebody to Jesus, what, what is there some like a process? Do they put the hands up? Do they stand up? Do they walk to the back? What, what do you do? Yeah. And they said, oh, it's not happened yet. So we don't have anything in place. So I said, okay, well, I'll preach. But do you mind if I preach a kingdom centric message? A kingdom centric gospel, not a Christian centric gospel. So the message wasn't don't try drugs, don't try all these things because they won't make you happy. God came, He loves you, He'll fulfill your life. That wasn't the message. Hmm. My message was this world's broken, isn't it? God has a plan for this world. It's called the kingdom of heaven. Let me describe it to you. Do you want to bring that? Do you want to bring that in the world? Do you want to be part of that? Hmm. If so, you need to repent of your sin. If so, you need to understand Jesus died on the cross. If so, you turn from your sin and be part of what God is doing on the planet. So I gave the appeal. I'm not the best speaker in the world. I gave the appeal. Three quarters of the kids responded. And interesting to me, every single boy did. Hmm. There's a generation that wants a cause and the world is happy to give them a cause. We're just happy to give them a seat to sit on. Uh, and we need to explain to them this, what, what is this thing that's inside them that wants to do something and make a difference in the world. And, and, and the, you know, there's lots of rebels without a cause, but more often there's rebels with the wrong kind of cause. Mm. Uh, and we've got this cause called the kingdom of heaven, but we don't preach it. We preach what I think is quite, I think it comes across sometimes quite dissent, disingenuous because I think they see through it. So basically you're just telling me to, to be like the rest of the world, sometimes quite selfish, but, but if I do the right things, God will give me what I want. What you described in that is way less introspective of uh, of a call, for lack of a better term, than I've ever heard in, in my entire life of being a Christian. Mm. It, is, it is typically very introspective. Look at yourself. Look yeah. what you've done. Look what you need. Um, and that's that's interesting to me that that you would describe it in this other way uh and i think it makes sense that you not that not that women or girls would not want to invo- engage in this but but i think uh young men want a cause they yeah. are maybe more verb oriented yeah and so if if it's described to them in those terms the reaction I could see being different where maybe uh, women tend to be a little more introspective and um, would react differently to that. Mm. I don't know. I'm making wild assumptions. I just thought that I was an interesting anecdote that you added yeah. in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, Jeff, one of those, his lightning round questions, which it's in every lightning round is like, what happened to men? <laughs> <laughs> but there is something to yeah. um, whatever the reason, and there's probably disagreement about that stuff, or what needs to happen, even outside of the church, there's a recognition that there's a lot of aimless young men mm. that have no purpose. Um, yeah, the uh, I'm blanking on the term f- for it, but uh, losers. <laughs> your words, not mine. Uh, no, but aimless, just, wandering. Yeah, yeah. or um, incels, involuntary. One of the word terms that's used is involved. They're involuntarily celibate because they're just they're mm-hmm. aimless. They they don't they they have no interest. Is that what incel is short for? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Ba- basically, a, a crude way is like a sort of a loser type that has no direction, mm. doesn't have their crap together. Um, I am not involuntarily celibate. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're from a different time. <laughs> um. But so, there is something to that, like the rise of people like Jordan Peterson and and yeah. the unhealthy version is like red pilled manosphere stuff where it's like, hey, you rediscover your manhood and take the girl and you know, there's like the perverted versions of that. Mm. Be, but it's it's all because there is just large swaths of people that don't have a direction and um Yeah. And I, that's a part of it, I think. And so th- oh sorry. No, go ahead. And so I think the church has to respond, as in leaders of the church have to respond, yeah. not to get people in our church, oh, well, this is the latest trend, so we need to do this again, but to read, get in line with what God has always been doing, right? Yeah. So so, so I have, and so some of the biggest challenges um, I face are it, the hardest person to convert is a church leader, in my opinion. Um, so, because for what, me, one of Why do you think? 
uh, I don't know, but I, but I tell you my experience. Sure. So, so for, and then we'll all tell you ours, why we think. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I, I work with a lot of churches and I love them, but I think, and let me, actually, let me go back to why I think, I think it's because most, most of us climb the ladder that we see in front of us. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as the, as the cliche goes, we climb it and we get to the top only to realize as we look over the wall, it's leaning against the wrong wall. Um, and so I think a lot of great people are leading churches based off the Christian culture uh, of, you know, and the metrics are lots of bums on seats, right? Sure. Um, so one of the questions I ask, so, so for instance, is, um, so um, day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out, not for the first time. In the Old Testament it happened, but it was it was occasional just for certain people. Now everyone gets a vision, right? Young, old, male, female, we all get vision. And then in Ephesians, pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles uh, are given to equip the saints for works of service. But you don't see that. What you see is you go to church, and in every church I've ever been to in recent times, there's a table or a stand where I can sign up. And I think this is a good thing. I can sign up to serve the basically the pastor's vision. Mm. Okay? So I can... So what's your gift? Oh, I've got a gift of hospitality. Great, be on the hospitality team. Or you like young people, be be on the youth. You like your musician, worship. I make I'd, a great cup of coffee. What should I do? Yeah, there you go. All that's fine. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I don't think we should remove that. I'm I'm not one of these. Let's get rid of all this and do this instead. I just think we just have to. It's just about maturity. My question is, where's the other table? Where's the table that says, "Here's the vision that God's given me." Where do I sign up so my pastor, teacher, evangelist can equip me to do that mm. and resource me to do that? Mm. That would multiply the vision from one or two people or what is it, 20% of the church that are doing all the work. Um, so we need to empower people's vision. Now we need some kind of, sorry, if I'm ranting now. Next sorry, no, I have a, I'm, I got to finish your thought and I got a question chambered for that. Okay, so we, we need to obviously have some kind of process for that because yeah. any loony could turn up and say, I've got a vision, give me some money and give me some people and give me a platform. Yeah, drinking beer for Jesus. Yeah, whatever, whatever it might be. <laughs> um, but there needs to, but, but there's no thought or care or process in that where there's tons of process and intentionality into how can we get you into our church's program. And again, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm just saying, where's the other table? And so we've got a lot of people who have a vision. So, so if in most churches... I'd have gone to my pastor and said, there's all these kids in schools and I think I could reach all these kids. Yeah. But what would have been said to me is, that's great, be the youth pastor. Help us with our youth. If you've got love for young people, and, and occasionally you could, you could reach those schools. Instead, my pastor said, go for it, what do you need? How do we help you? What do we equip you with? 30 years later, we've reached millions of kids. Last year we reached, and this we're still rebuilding after COVID, last year we reached 220,000 young people in schools. Hmm. So the vast majority of them will have never heard the gospel before. Mm. And that's because a pastor prioritized the kingdom, his, God's mission over his ministry. And what does uh, reached 220,000 kids mean? What does the reached part mean? It, um, uh, uh, we went into schools and at some point in some aspects have shared the gospel with young people. Wow. So the question I had chambered was, apart from the lack of established process to like the intake process for, I've got this crazy idea that I think could be really good that I'm passionate about. How can you help equip me that extra table that you're alluding to Mm. apart from like a lack of an established process, what prevents churches from supporting that? I think I'm going to say theology. I don't, there's a theology behind it. I think there's, um, I think to spark a movement, you need three things. You you need a new message, you need a new method, and you need new metrics, a new measurement. And I think it starts with a new message. You need a new message. So as we're leading young people to Jesus, we're not preaching to them, be rescued. We're saying, yeah, Jesus did rescue you, but we're saying, be recruited. Mm. Um, I don't think that's what we're preaching in our churches. So we have a bait and switch issue, right? So... In my opinion, you may have a different experience. My yeah. experience, 
generally around the world because I'm working around the world with churches. So I'm big picture thinking is most cases it's God will change your life. It's introspective. I like that yeah. word. Yeah. God will change your life. Um, and then as you become discipled, you later find out there's some, there's this extra stuff that you should be doing really as well. You should be discipling people. Um, whereas, you know, one of my questions is when did, I probably asked you this last time, but when did, when did the disciples first become Christians? Never. I mean, never in the sense of that we cool. do it. Probably when they reviewed the four spiritual laws <laughs> in, the, in the pamphlet on the road to Damascus. Okay. Uh, and then there was some perfume involved. And they, were, they were caught. Like Jesus said, hey, come follow me. So at it's, that point, and this, this is to back up what you just said, at that point when they first followed him, did they understand he was God? No. No. Which, which we would say you need to to be a Christian. Yeah, right? they got it wrong up until the the end, and even after the end. like yeah. as Jesus is dying, I know for, for a fact what, Peter and was it Peter and James are like, hey, right hand, left hand, we're with you, and they're, they're thinking like we're going to take over Rome. Yeah. So the answer is we don't know, um, but what we do know is that Peter said we have come to believe. Hmm. So at some point on the journey. They came to believe. So my other question is, when did you, did sorry, when did Jesus first start to disciple the disciples? When they first started to follow him, so he disciples them. He tells them what the mission is. Yeah. And at some point, it's like like the awkward conversation. At some point, the vision becomes clearer. The vision of who God is, who Christ is, and what God's trying to do. Because, like you say, even at the end, they're still not getting it wrong. You know, they're still not quite understanding how this kingdom of God is going to be advanced. Right. They're still getting the saws out and chopping ears off, right? Right. They're not understanding it. So it's a, it's a gradual process. But I think from the beginning, Jesus is explaining the mission. He's preaching the kingdom. You know, in, in fact, John did before. And then when John was put in prison, when John died, it seems Jesus took over. It says from that moment, he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It feels like in a lot of ways, the deck is stacked against society these days. Uh, I think technology fosters a lot of navel gazing, mm -hmm. and what what you've described is is a presentation of: Do you want to be part of something that's bigger than yourself? Right. And so much. I mean, down to the naming of products: the iPhone. <laughs> Yeah, like, right. Uh, have and and the emphasis on the individual, um, and the self help movement. Mm -hmm. All of these things have are rooted in some level of positivity. Mm. There's, it's not bad. Mm. Yeah, to want to better yourself. Um, but what just continues to be striking to me about what you're describing is that this is. This is asking people, um, are you willing to be part of something that's bigger than yourself? And along the way, you will be changed too. Mm. And I think like that resonates for me, for sure. I see how that would resonate for young men. I could see how that would resonate for young women as well, as, as we're all dads of daughters. I don't know if you have any kids. And uh, you've got sons as well. So you could tell us both sides of the story, Jeff. But... Um, but I think that that's that's an attractive message, and I wonder, like, why is that why is that message not more common? Uh, I have no idea because I'm no genius. It just seems obvious to me when I read the Bible that that's what the message of Jesus was. So I, I literally don't know the answer to that, um, apart from the fact that the devil blinds our eyes, right, and he perverts us, so or he distracts us. Yeah, right? well, exactly. A perversion is something starts on a truth, but goes to a different end goal. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. he's, he doesn't create anything really, does he, the devil? He just perverts things. So, kids need a cause. There's a, God's put a cause within them, but rather than showing them what the cause really is, the kingdom of heaven, he perverts it to all the nonsense that we see nowadays. Mm. Yeah, and I feel like there's also a, a cultural bleed in. There's this... American achievement, individualism, like America is very individual or has been. And there's really good sides to that. People that want to 
excel and achieve. And I think mm. some of that bleeds into the way we do church, where it's like individual salvation. And I'm not saying that's not a thing, but if you look at the Bible, some of the, when Jesus is going to different houses, based on one family family member, he's like, you are forgiven. And like the entire house mm. believed. Mm. And it was like very much a more communal aspect, like a, a group, an awareness of the group. It was less emphasis on the individual. And I think if you, just my personal opinion about if you're only thinking about the whole, oftentimes individuals get thrown under the bus because this is better for everyone. Mm. And conversely, if it's only individualistic, that can it's obvious how that can be uh, perverted. And yeah. so I think some of that is bleeding into the way we do church where it's just individual salvation, make an individual decision. And you're sort of like, what's left out is like, how do you, how do you fit into the bigger picture of, of doing what Jesus did? Yeah. Which, you know, I might use different language to describe some of these things, Mm. but ultimately I'm convinced of the, the more people radically live out agape love in their life, the the world will be transformed. Mm. Yeah. I agree. We solved it, guys. Throw the ball in the air. We solved all the problems. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so is Kingdom Centric, is that your newest? Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, kind of odd because it's um, out of all the other books, I kind of like subsidiaries of that, but I wrote them first and then this kind of caps it all. Okay. Uh, and and then the next book will be Kingdom Centric Church. So try to take a picture of what does Kingdom Centric Church look like. So how many, how many books does this make that you've written nine okay so you finished you had two trilogies back yeah back in the day yeah and you finished those and does this start to kind of meld that all together yeah and, it does yeah okay yeah exactly in fact at the end of each chapter it kind of suggests one of the other books as a follow-up to go you know if you want to know more about okay. thinking through giving hmm. or serving or you want to think details. more details yeah that's great. So if theoretically, hypothetically, if I've never read any of your books, Paul, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's just imagine right there so for a basically moment. A backslider. Yeah, about. if I'm yeah, okay. a backsliding, questionably <laughs> saved Christian. Uh, Incel. Can I start <laughs> in <cell? laughs> Can I start with this? Yeah. Do I need any background or is it like, no, hey, no, this no, thing no. can stand alone? Yeah, I, yeah, and that's the whole point. It's a standalone. It's almost an introduction. I mean, there's a lot There's a lot of yeah, stuff in it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would start with that. But I mean, it's, uh, what are we, uh, I'm going to make a guess here. We're 160 pages? I have no idea. Oh, let's find out. It's, oh no, even less. 140. I was 20 off. I mean, this is, uh, you, you can make your way through this. Um, you're not, I'm not signed up for, um, an entire seminary class. How but, dare you, Andy? Yeah. Our, our audience is smart. They know how to read. They uh, smart books. has nothing to do with it. I appreciate efficiency. Okay. And I like an efficient <laughs> right. man. And what I'm seeing here is efficiency. economy of words and That's, I like it. Yeah. yeah it's so concise. It's, it's concise. So it goes, and each chapter is, um, starts off with religion, then the gospel, then righteousness. There's all the subjects as serving, as giving. Yeah. There's um, discipleship, I can't remember them all. Calling, how do you know if God's calling you, what's calling to you, it's all that kind of stuff. And so if, I am, if I am someone who's l- been a Christian for over 40 years, or if I've been a Christian for four years, will I, will both of those versions of me enjoy this book? Yeah, I think so. Um, That's cool. There's some, there's some depth in it. I, I like to say, you know, in our teaching, I'm always encouraging my guys, be simple but not shallow. So simple, yeah. a bit like a single playing record. There's a catchy tune, but not shallow. It's like an album track where you've got depth. You know, you listen to the, the melody and then it's the, the guitars and it's the bass. Afterwards, you can listen to it for a while. So so I think it's a bit like that. Wow. Oh, I man, it. I'm going to steal that. I love I'm, the musical metaphor. Yeah. I love the musical metaphor, but I'm going to steal that because that resonates with me so much that if you can be simple and not shallow, mm. it's, it's often more meaningful and more powerful yeah. In terms of impact, uh, yeah. so often you get simple and shallow together, yeah. um, which is, I don't have a lot of patience for. Oh, so yeah. just connected to this, and we're kind of, I think we're 
land on the plane here soon, but the kingdom centric, when you go into a new country, new area, and you're bringing the pays movement, what is on on your heart, on your mind, moving into, you know, talking with church or being in that community, what, what, how does, how do you do that? How does somebody within the pays movement do that? How do you enter into, you know, striking up conversation and connection? That was a lot. That was a big question. I know, I know, um, I know, but it's, it's, yeah, um, it's kind of like, a, what's a synopsis? Well, let, let how can I start this myself? How do you do your whole ministry, Paul? <laughs> you have 15 seconds. I mean, is, it, is it literally a phone call? Is it going down to an area? Like, how does it all, how does it, because you're connected with churches. Yeah. I'm, I could I separate those two, two things. Absolutely. So let's start with the last question, which is how do you start a conversation? Yes. Um, are you talking about with the gospel or are you talking about how do I start with a church? Or do you want both answers? You're asking like, how do you go from I haven't done we haven't done anything in South Africa to now we're doing something in so, South Africa? So let me give you a, a, a more of a philosophical answer then. So I asked the question, why is it we spend so much time, energy, and resources inviting people when Jesus spent so much of his getting himself invited? And so how do we get ourselves invited into the conversation? Mm. Or how do we as the church get invited into the the community, the city? without pushing ourselves or saying we have a right to speak. Um, so for when what we're trying to do is is give people an experience of the kingdom of God. So what I do personally, if I'm trying to bring pays, God gave us this word ages ago that if we gave the teaching away, got the teaching out, the teaching would lead people to engage with us, which was not what I thought. I thought what we do is just common sense, right? So most 94% of people who become Christians do it before the age of 18 most of them in school, someone else has bought the building, someone else is paying the staff, someone else is, is paying the gas and electric bills. Duh. You know, it's, yeah. and I've gone, I've gone, I've traveled the world sharing that. Let's do schools work. Nothing. But I followed this word and it was get the teaching out. So now what I do is I go in, I talk about being kingdom centric. And for some reason, people then want pays. You've got young people who live like this and they want to share this. Let's get a team. So, Excuse me. The three things we're offering churches are um, teams, training, and templates. Um, so the teams you know about, uh, we offer a gap year. So eighteen to thirty year olds, um, they can do it one year. Now they can do a two or three year version. Uh, their training accommodation meals is provided for, and we put them in teams, base them in a church, and they reach into the community. Um, but we also provide training. I do these kind of what we call a masterclass suite. So how to disciple anyone in anything or how to reach anyone anywhere or how to study anything with anyone hmm. or how to build something good together. So I do a Sunday morning inspirational message and then an evening or afternoon workshop. And for some reason they open the door and then churches tend to want teams. And we're hoping to bring that to California. So I'm speaking in churches this weekend, um, sorry, um, in the weekends over August um for that reason to open the doors and already got churches that want pays teams which is great which is answer your question was that what you were asking i mean i'm motivated i'm excited i okay. like I've, i think i said this last time like i, I want to like let's go okay oh, my gap year <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or three yeah. i think andy was gonna ask the same question i was yeah. gonna ask well which the, churches yeah, yeah can you share which churches you're speaking in while you're while you're uh, here yes yeah, so I just spoke at Lifesong Church and Hillside Church in Chino Hills. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm about to speak at Anthem Church in San Diego mm -hmm. and then Breakthrough Church somewhere north of here. And I don't know the name of the place. Sorry. And then I've got a free Sunday on the 1st of September. I don't have anywhere to preach right now. What happened when one of my board members lives in California? And they were like, oh, you need to do some stuff in California. Yeah. And so, so we got an Airbnb for a month. Um, but um, you, it's hard to get bookings last minute. So, but I managed to do most of them, which is good. Just got one Sunday left. So, I might know a place I can poke around to see. Uh, okay, if there's good. an opportunity there. That's yeah, really cool. that's cool. Um, all right, can I ask a left field question? Yeah, uh, yeah. Or did were you? Of you, course. Okay, <coughs> Paul. When you're not doing ministry stuff, 
Um, what is, what activity or thing do you like to do to relax, to unwind? What fills your, what fills your bucket outside of, um, your vocation? So I like outdoor pursuits, hiking, sailing. I don't, I say surfing, but I'm, I'm speaking wrong guys. You know what surfing is by go bodyboarding with the fins out in the backs. I like that. So North, North side of Hunson Pier is what I'm hoping to do a lot of this, this, this trip. Um, and yeah, skiing as well. Just outdoors pursuits. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, Until I'm too old to be able to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. That's all right. Just oh, mountain biker. Got into mountain biking about four years ago. Oh, That's nice. Cool. Yeah. Get one with a motor on it. Have you, have you, <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Those are great. Uh, so I do, I do want to satisfy my ego. I, I had a thought, and this goes back a little bit, but... Real quick, I like how you talk about how the churches churches often have. Oh, you can join up. You can you can volunteer here. You can yeah. do this. It's very segmented. It's controlled. It's clean. All that stuff. But the individual, it's like, well, I feel like I need to be doing this. It's different. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people have suffer from paralysis by analysis where they're like, oh, what does God want me to do? What's the mm. one thing? I, I feel like God wants me to do one thing. And I think what you're preaching or talking about with allowing people to have their their passions or what they feel like God wants them to, and then the church, how do I support you doing that? Free, it just It takes the load off because I've always felt, or for a long time I've felt, as someone who has previously struggled with just oh, what's the one thing I feel like I'm missing it? Mm. It's like, what do you love to do, and can you do that to glorify God or yeah. or like to, to serve the kingdom, to make the world a better place? That that's a good starting point, mm. and that's like, hey, I love to do this thing, and I feel like I can do it at this church. And then mm. if more churches come on to the the philosophy of like, well, we have this over here, yeah, but I don't want to do coffee and donuts or whatever it is. If it's more like, okay, how can we help you? That sounds good. Let's help you. Hmm. So it, you're so right. Like you it don't have a humble servant's heart. It would be and exponential. If you, did, if you did, you would want to, you would willingly, joyfully sign up for donuts and coffee <laughs> service on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, so my, my silly question is, uh, it's not silly, but we've all heard somebody that's felt like they're hearing from God and it's when you initially hear it, you're like, I don't think so. <laughs> so what is, do you have any examples? And uh, I want social security numbers and first and last names, if possible, of people that it's like, oh, God, God wants me to do this. And you're instantly, you're like, I'm not sure you're hearing from God. I was joking about the specifics, but do you have any specific examples yeah. of that come to mind where it's like, yeah, maybe let's just redirect you yeah. to donuts and coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this may not be direct. I think it's an answer to your question. So I think when you think you're hearing God, it's one of three things, imagination, manipulation, or revelation. So it's either just your imagination, which is not a bad thing. That but, can be good. Yeah. Or, or it's manipulation, either you're manipulating God or somebody's trying to manipulate you, or it's revelation. If it's revelation, you need to do it. I've got some great examples of God. I've got the great examples of the opposite of God saying something really clear to people and then people ignoring it. Mm. But one, one, one thing I think happens that, a lot that you're kind of talking about is that God says something and because it's an ongoing conversation, we don't go into the conversation. We just take that one thing yeah. and we can immediately connect it to the nearest thing we know that looks like that. So for instance, I remember somebody once saying to me, God's called me to be a doctor in Africa. And I was well, very specific, you know, very mm -hmm. specific. I said, Oh, how did that happen? Cause I'm interested in, in the conversation, the process. Oh, well, God told me I'm going to heal I'm going to heal the nations. Okay, so so this person took, you're going to heal the nations, which I think is a theme to be explored, mm -hmm. to, okay, so that means I'm probably going to be a doctor and the people that need most healing is Africa. So God's called me to be a... And uh, I think the reason we miss God in our lives isn't because we don't know what he looks like, it's because we've decided in advance what he looks like. And so God's doing this, but mm -hmm. we're, we're looking here, right? Yeah. So is that answering your question? 
Yeah, I was hoping for more juicy, like weird stories of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> God told me to become a tree here. My know. my favorite of all time. <laughs> my buddy played a concert at a Christian college, and I've told this story before. But a uh, guy comes up to him afterwards. He's like, "Man, that 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 sounded great. Your guitar amp sounded so good." And I was I was almost going to get that same guitar amp, but I really felt like. The Lord was telling me to get a bigger one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I had a friend who, um, and again, God can maybe use this, but I had a friend who... Um, that was John Mayer, by the way. John Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend who was trying to think about whether he should go to um, Bible college. And one of the Bible colleges had a course called Oasis. And they were praying about it. And as it came out, an Oasis song was playing. And Ooh. therefore felt... That's God speaking to me. I, I, who knows? God God works with us the way we are, so maybe. <laughs> anyway, I've heard here's Wonderwall. Yeah. <laughs> Good Manchester band, of course. Yeah, well, some would say it's the greatest band ever. Oh. Well, Oasis would say that, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are fantastic. We have, uh, we've done house shows here, and the, and, and the way to make sure that the cops don't show up is that you invite the neighborhood, <laughs> and there's no one left to call the cops. Right. And uh, we have done a couple of oasis tunes yeah. and and i i heard god that night yeah and everyone's <laughs> everyone joins in have you done the stone roses uh i know the stone roses yeah um we have we haven't done those oh that's brilliant that first album was amazing yeah oh that reminds me okay as we're landing i had a- I, I haven't answered this asked this question in a while but uh, and i don't remember if i did it the first time but it doesn't matter our podcast is like the human body every seven years it's a brand new podcast <laughs> so um what so you're walking into the the kingdom of heaven now this is the 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 version of it that's you know pearly gates you're and walking everything. through the gates of the new jerusalem what is your walk-in song and who is your hype person living or dead could be whoever who is escorting you in? I love that look. <laughs> that's, that reaction is perfect. <laughs> that's, that's equivalent to what was Jesus' pickup line? No, no, it's, it's better than that. It, it's, better, it's better. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. No I, can't, I can't believe I've not got an answer. So my problem is I've got answers, but they're not. I can't say them. So <laughs> yes, you well, can. If you need to take a moment and have a conversation with God, <laughs> <laughs> or if, if you want to say the thing you want to say, and I can bleep it out, that often is funnier than the actual thing. So just I'm going to go with your question. What was your question? <laughs> What's that? Oh, I'm what walking through the pearly gates. Yeah. Walking through the pearly yeah, gates. Yeah, walking yeah. through the pearly gates. Song. Yeah, what song is playing? This, like, imagine um, you're like a box championship boxer, and you're about to enter your glory and destroy the heavyweight. Have contender. you heard of a, another Manchester band called Elbow? Oh, oh yeah, good God. lads. I'm which which song? Um, well, I'm actually, um, I'm trying to remember the. I don't can't remember what the song's called, but um, it's about a beautiful day. No, it's not a beautiful day. It's um, one one day like this. Oh my God! You know yeah. that song. Yeah. It's yeah. like a song with two halves because there's like a tune for the beginning and a tune for the second half. So I think that's a, a great yeah. song. One day, like, can somebody pull that song up, producer Nate? What uh, is going on over there? We for, would, we would whatever. get uh, demonetized. We're five not seconds. We get demonetized. Five, five seconds. seconds. <laughs> we get struck down. But uh, th- that's, is it called one day? One, one day, day like, like this. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day like this. So that would be. And then what was the other part? Who would? Oh, who's your hype man? Yeah. Who's there beside you? Who's being like, walking in with and you? Now like, hey, coming into heaven right now. I don't know. Paul Gibbs. The person <laughs> want to be there. If 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 that's how it happened, would be my wife, the Foxy Lynn. Oh, nice. All right. Her first name is Foxy. <laughs> no, well, I called her the Foxy Lynn. So <laughs> that's good, man. The funny, as as you described that, the thing that stuck out of my head was I, I I used to do this thing where I would I would challenge people to say, hey. Who do you think is the greatest American rock band? And I'm going to narrow it really quickly. By band, I mean it can't be solo artist. Okay. So it's not like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. It would have to be like Aerosmith band. And you would be shocked how many people mention British bands. As American bands. And they, yeah, they'd be like, whoa, well, Led Zeppelin's my favorite. I'm oh, like, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nope. Yeah. Oh, well, then Rolling Stone. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> 
Who you, who would you say who's your favorite American band? I have an I have favorite, a favorite American or the band. greatest oh. American rock band. I don't know. Yeah, I have a very controversial answer. What, what what's the difference for you then? So is a favorite, and then there's an well, a, yeah, yeah. I think the greatest American rock band is Creedence Clearwater Revival oh. by my very specific definition. Interesting. <laughs> yes, where there's it's not individual. But and your favorite band is. That's impossible. Okay. Paul, that's impossible. If you had asked Andy in the 20s, it's clearly Radiohead. Oh. But a, that's a British band though. Might have heard of them. Yeah, you just asked who my I favorite band the, was. Oh, I thought you meant I thought we were still on the American band thing. No, no, greatest American rock band though. That's where But yeah, it's funny. I, I just I thought thought I'd throw that little anecdote out there. So many people by accident mention British bands. I'm like, mm. I'm my, so, f- my favorite is probably Talking Heads. I like Talking Heads. Talking oh, Heads yeah. is your favorite band? Probably. Favorite American, American band. band. Oh, American band. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and Elbow's the favorite just. Yeah, Elbow's great. All time. Elbow. There's Manchester a, is just the place for music, I think. There's so. a couple of Elbow songs that are on the list of, I was, I, my wife and I were having a sad moment and we were just like listening to music that's just like, hey, we just need to feel sad. So we're going to listen to music <laughs> that feels that way and. There's a couple songs that fit into the sad and happy at the same time. One Day Like This is one of them. Mm-hmm. Also, another Elbow song, Magnificent. Mm-hmm. Um, but the One Day Like This, where he has this lyric, it's it taps into my nostalgic. I love... Nostalgia always gets me. And like mm-hmm. the idea of being with somebody for a long yeah. time and, and you love them. Like He has this line about, kiss me when my lips are thin, like yeah. when I'm old, and like we're, but we're still together and we still love each other. And, mm-hmm. Just, I mean, I'm getting chills right now. It's, it's, uh, it's just, it's so emotional and so awesome. And uh, I, as you were talking about the favorite American band, every band that came to mind, I'm like, oh yeah, they're British, they're British, <laughs> they're British. But I don't know what my answer. So is. I, I never made a connection because that, that was the song, and then you said, "Who would you walk in?" I said, "My wife." So we've been married 34 years now. Okay, wow, so kind of work, kind of works, doesn't it? Yeah, connection. yeah, Definitely. yeah. Well, and that ties back in my mind to the. The simple yet deep, like that line is is simple yet mm. yet there's layers to it, right? Yeah, mm. and those are the things that like it's easy to it's easy to walk away with that, and it sticks in there, and you can chew on that for a while. Yeah, mm. um, I love that. That's good. Awesome. Well, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but pace movement dot life. No, um, so either pays.life, P-A-I-S, P-A-I-S. Dot life, okay. or paysmovement.com. Okay, okay, that's the one I wrote down. And also Facebook, Instagram, YouTube is all Pays Movement, uh, Pays movement P-A-I-S, Movement. Okay. Um, anything else you want to mention? No, it's just if people know anybody who's interested in doing a life on mission and want to do a gap year or two-year leadership course or three-year get into ministry, then send them our way. And uh, where can they get this book? Amazon. Amazon. And the book is called Kingdom, Kingdom-Centric Reframing Christianity. Yeah. And it'll be an audio version at some point soon as well. Are you going to read that? AI. Oh, AI right. is going to read the it? freakiest thing. In your voice? Oh, mate, it's so freaky. Um, I, I, <laughs> so my publisher sent me, me, they sent me, me reading some, I'm going, I don't. I don't remember when I had to do this. I don't. It's not you. It's a robot. Oh it was the God. freakiest thing. Really? So, oh, you didn't even. No, you were I, like. Yeah, I thought it was me. Part, it was like it, no. It was it was a bit posher because I have a bit of a rubbish accent. So <laughs> my um, it was yeah, like the, it's the Texas it's the, is really coming through. Yeah, it's the version of me my dad wanted. He's reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm suppressing the technical details of how it's actually amazing and how quickly that can work now. I used to work for Alexa at Amazon. Uh, That used to be really hard to do. It used to take a long time. Now you can do it in like Uh, 10 minutes. Crazy. All right. Well, we will do listener feedback next time. Um, But a quick shout out to Zach Corcoran. 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 (laughs) <laughs> Cochran. Zach, it's core, C O R. Or maybe it's Corker. C O R, C O R. On YouTube. Hey, he was stoked. He was the 401st subscriber and he said he loves the pod. Love this podcast, guys. So shout out to you and we'll do listener feedback next time. 
you know, hat tip to Dave Millsap and all the usuals who had some thoughtful stuff that we'll get to you at some point. So appreciate Thanks, it. People. Yes. And so Thank listeners, you me. if you are uh, looking for a way to get a hold of us, of course, like, and subscribe on all of the podcast channels that you listen to um, help us out by sharing this with at least one person this week. If uh, you felt like this was interesting and you know, someone else who might find this interesting as well. Super great. We love the comments. The comments uh, on YouTube are some of the our favorite parts about us shifting to video. So please keep the comments coming because um, we're curious about what you think. If you agree with Paul or if you think Paul is full of it this week, let us know. And we'll make sure that we pass it along to Paul directly. <laughs> 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 Only the bad stuff. Uh, but for Zach, Jeff, and Paul, I am Andy. Grace. Peace. Cheers. And Nate. Wait, Nate didn't get fired. Oh, Nate didn't get fired. Oh. Shoot. You're uh, fired, Nate. I almost fired you in the middle, but <laughs> I refrained. Paul had my attention. <laughs> I'm so impressed you guys even know Elbow. And now you're quoting lyrics. Bro. That's impressive. I didn't know Americans knew Elbow. You're one of my favorite bands right now. Seriously? And